Welcome to episode 188 of Your Career Podcast. Well, hello, welcome back. I'm your host, Jane Jackson, your career management coach on a mission to make careers guidance, inspiration and advice accessible to all who need it. Your Career Podcast does just that. There's plenty of career management and career transition advice, personal branding and job search information, plus interviews with fascinating professionals who have made amazing career changes. Today, my very talented guest is Rachel Smith, founder of Rachel's List. Now, before we launch into our interview, if you enjoy Your Career Podcast, please take a minute to leave a review on iTunes because it's a nice thing to do and it helps this podcast to reach more people who may need support. And for ongoing career development and career transition support, join the Careers Academy online. If you happen to be seeking career clarity so you can make the right decisions in your career, download my career clarity pack at janejacksoncoach.com forward slash career clarity pack. Rachel Smith is a freelance journalist, copywriter, and content writer, and the founder of Rachel's List, a hugely successful jobs board and creative community. Rachel has written for a range of magazines and newspapers, including Choice, The Sydney Morning Herald, Good Health, Women's Fitness, Vacations and Travel, Inside Out, and many more. As a copywriter, she's worked on projects for Uncle Toby's, Deck of Secrets, Acon, Destination New South Wales, MasterCard, and NAB. She's worked for large organizations such as Bauer Media and for the public sector as well as the private. She stays agile, positive, and adaptable to change, essential traits for anyone in the creative field and especially for those who freelance. We met a number of years ago when I was a recruiter and I was seeking talented copywriters. We kept in touch through mutual respect of each other's niche and now it's time for her her to share her career story. Rachel's life is essentially all about staying sane while juggling her deadlines. Rachel's list and about 587 questions a day from her five-year-old. Copious amounts of tea and wine help too. So let's welcome Rachel to the show. Welcome, Rachel. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Jane. I'm really excited. And it's been a long time coming since we met about 10 years ago, I think, when I was recruiting. And mm. somehow we got in touch, I think, because I was trying to source for copywriters. And there you were. Yeah. And ever since then, we have never met, but we've always corresponded. So we're both in Sydney and we're like pen pals. That's true. I mean, we, we've we kind of done a lot. We've collaborated a lot for, for online friends, haven't we? But, um, oh. yeah, I think we've been trying to do this podcast for about five years. <laughs> I know, I know. Ever since I started podcasting, you're the person to, to interview. But yeah. you, know what, you know what's so interesting is is that you've had such a fantastic career as a freelancer, and yes. I really want to find out what your secrets to success are, uh, because you you freelanced really for all of your career. But before we get into that, how about yeah. just to kick us off, let's find out what your early career aspirations were when you were a little girl. Yeah, well, it's funny that you should ask actually, because anyone who goes to Rachel's list um, and reads my bio on any of the blog posts that I've written. It says something like, you know, um, when Rachel was a child, she used to carry around a suitcase of pen and paper so she could stop and write stories when the when the mood took her. And, um, yeah, and that's actually a true story. You know, I did have this suitcase. I had loads of pen and paper and I, I did used to stop and write stories in the street, sit on the curb and write stories or I would make cards for the neighbours. I distinctly remember one of the neighbours, their dog died and all the neighbourhood kids came to me and asked me to open the suitcase and we all made cards for this neighbour whose dog had died and took them over and, um, you know, wrote lovely messages in them and she just stood at the front door and cried and cried. Oh. And uh, so from a very early age I, I wanted to be a writer and I was always, you know, wrangling words in some way. 
Yeah. Mm, so it's in your blood as a, as a writer. So, I mean, now that's interesting because you've got your uh, degree in English literature. Yes. Yeah. And then a when long you... time ago, <laughs> <laughs> a long, long time ago. But then so once you graduated, you know, most people, they, they go to school, they go to university, they go to college or tech or wherever. And then when they graduate, the first thing they want to do is to get a job. However, for you, it, it, it looks like through stalking your LinkedIn in profile as well <laughs> it was freelancing through and through so so tell us how did your career begin so I um I wanted to do mass communications and I didn't end up taking that path I actually did literature which was fantastic and because I wasn't doing mass communications but I knew that I wanted to be a journalist I did everything in my power to get clippings you know so that I would have work to show so I wrote for the uni newspapers and the uni magazines I worked on the radio um, and I also pitched stories to magazines while I was at uni and got a couple of travel stories published and then when I left uni um I went to, uh, I worked, actually, I worked on a, um, a baby magazine. Oh, no, hang on. No, the first magazine I worked on was a family um, computer magazine. And um, that was for a company in Sydney. And it was just, I got that job through a friend of a friend. So I sort of started as an editorial assistant and then moved up until I was assistant editor. And then I, I wanted to go to London. So I went to London and I worked um, for IPC back then, which was like the sister company to... Um, what is now Bauer Media and I worked on baby magazines there as a sub-editor and um, I did that for three years and then I came back and sort of um, slowly got into magazines as a sub again and then started feature writing and um, and yeah my career began very much as a freelancer and I didn't know any other freelancers back then it was really quite lonely Um, but I managed to land a job I was doing a lot of writing for a lot of the weekly magazines at Bauer and then I managed to land a job. I was so lucky. I did a test and I landed a job as a movie reviewer um, for TV Week and then I got picked up as a movie reviewer for NW and so I was the movie reviewer for both of those magazines for 10 years. So my whole first 10 years as a freelancer, I just basically sat in little theatrettes all over the you know, the city reviewing movies all day long. <laughs> what, a, what a hard life. It that was must a dream have job. so <laughs> tough. And you must have seen some really good films and some really deadly films, so it must have been really fun. Are you yeah. one of the writers who can be quite scathing when it comes to reviews? I guess I was a bit scathing, but also I was mindful of the audience, you know. Mm. They, they loved their pop culture and were very into entertainment, so... You know, I suppose I wasn't as scathing as some, but um, (laughs) it was really fun and it led into a lot of other types of reviewing. I did a lot of bar reviewing and I then edged into travel writing. I was a travel writer and a travel editor for years Um, and, yeah, it was just like the best. The beginning of my career was really, really good fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not to say it's not now, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it must have been very exciting as well because being able to actually get enough gigs or freelance gigs in order to make it uh, financially viable um, yeah. in those days before people really had even heard of what freelancing was must have been quite yeah. a challenge. So that means that you must have been very good at selling yourself. Well, actually, you know, I call it back then, it was like the salad days of magazines, you know, you were sitting on a dollar a word for a lot of these weekly magazines. Um, It was easy to get regular gigs. Um, If you knew a few editors, you could, you could get a lot of work. There was a lot of work out there. And there was, and also I knew a lot of people in magazines. So it was kind of a transition because I was sort of on staff as this movie reviewer and but I was also transitioning out to being a freelancer. Um, and so it was a really interesting transition and it wasn't until I started to meet a couple of others that I realised, oh, there's, you know, lots of other people out there doing this as well. But nobody seemed to know anyone. Like it wasn't like it is now where we're saturated with freelancers and the gig economy is booming and, you know, it was very, um, it was quite a lonely existence, yeah. And also movie reviewers back then, nobody really talked to each other and no one wanted to share their thoughts on the movie, obviously, because they wanted to put in their review. So it was very much, hello, hello, and then (laughs) that was it, you know. So I really craved having more friends in Mm. freelancing and, and that was really how Rachel's List started. But 
you might not want to get onto that yet. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, well, don't well, well, actually, but well, well, the, the interesting thing is is freelancing because it is running your own business. Yeah, you know, you, know, you can call yourself a freelancer, but you but you are self employed, yeah. um, and so. Being on staff at a magazine and knowing that you had this regular gig yeah, would have been yeah. great. But then yeah. with freelancing, it can be really quite cyclical and it must have been peaks and troughs of work as well. So yeah. so for anyone who might be thinking about going freelance or setting up their own own business or becoming self-employed, what, what would be your top tips for success in that area? Well, I think it's very different now to how it was back then. And I think you know, I'm under no illusions. I was extremely lucky to get those two movie gigs that lasted for as long as they did. You know, it was, it was incredible. Um, and I always think if you're going to start freelancing, um, it's, it's really a good idea to try and straddle both camps. So if you're in that full-time role, um, to sort of try and edge out, in your spare time, start pitching, you know, start doing some lead generation, looking for clients on the side, just so you're not going jumping cold into that world because that can be really scary. And by the same token, I think you should also at least try and have three to six months worth of expenses saved before you make the leap into freelancing, um, just so that you, again, know that you know, things are covered while you establish yourself, while you set yourself up, while you find clients and you're not so stressed about money that you're forced to take, um, you know, the lowest kind of paying clients. You can look for clients that, you know, pay market rates and, um, and, and will treat you well. And I think that that can set the tone for your career going forward. Mm-hmm. And you also need to be really um, agile and have this ability to adapt to things. Um, so for me personally, obviously, I started as a magazine writer predominantly. Um, but over the years, I, you know, it's so far now from what I do as a freelancer, I've had to completely, you know, um, reinvent, upskill, change what I do go into other income streams, um, find entirely new, um, you know, genres and, um, you know, like, you know, I've gone from an entertainment writer who used to review movies to writing about banking and a lot of business. And, um, you know, I write about some stuff that I never thought I would ever write about, you know, if you'd asked me 15 years ago. So there's really that ability to, you know, have faith in yourself and adapt to the market. Yeah. And I guess also being a writer, you do such thorough research that whatever the topic is, uh, you yeah. become an expert for a while in that. Well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, uh, one thing you touched upon, which, which I think must be the bane of every freelancer's uh, uh, career, is making sure you get paid on time. Yes. Because th- this is difficult because when you're when you're self-employed and you mm. perform a role uh, or you deliver a you know a, a piece that you've been writing on for a long time, I wonder how many freelancers get paid up front and how many have to invoice and then chase up. It really depends on what you do. Um, for copywriting, for example, um, it's it seems to be becoming a lot more accepted. Um, that you will charge 50% up front mm. and a client will just pay that as a deposit invoice or a commencement um, fee or commencement payment. Um, and if you can then have sort of progress payments along the project, that seems to be very much accepted. Um, in magazines, not so much. <laughs> so, you know, if you went to an editor and said, well, here's a story, I'd really love to write it for you, but I'm going to need a deposit before I start working on it. They would just laugh, laugh at you, you know, and, Similarly, if you were to get a commission for a magazine, um, you're on their payment schedule. They're not going to, you know, stick to yours. So if you say, well, you know, I'm going to send my invoice in that's got payment terms seven days, they're not even going to care, you know. You're on a 30-day payment schedule or you might be on a pay-on-publication schedule. So it really... I think you have to take all of those things into account because it's really important as a freelancer to be... um, to be cognizant of your cash flow and how you can keep it steady. Um, Because if you're constantly writing for editors who pay on publication and they hold your story off or they decide, well, we're not scheduling that for six months, you're going to constantly be stressed and, you know, um, 
in dire straits financially. So it's good to have your fingers in a few pies and to have perhaps a regular gig. If you can get a retainer, amazing, that repays on the first of the month so you know you've got that money coming in, you know you've got some of your expenses covered every month and then you can just plug the gaps. And if you really want to write for those amazing, there are some amazing magazines out there, particularly travel ones that pay on publication. And if you really want to write for those magazines, um, you know, you want to have all the other stuff set in place, all the other regular income popping into your account. So it doesn't matter so much if you write for someone um, to get your byline in the great magazine and the money's coming in three months, you know, because you're covered in other areas. Mm. So it's sort of really about you You have to really be conscious of the clients you choose and the type of work that you go after because a lot of that will um, depend on when you get paid, yeah. Yeah, it's so difficult, isn't it, to really market yourself and um, and get paid a decent amount for uh, for your writing because there are quite a number of publications these days who rely on contributors for free. Um, and the contributors will contribute because of the clout it is to be in their magazine. But that doesn't yeah. pay the bills, does it? No, and also, and that is a really big problem in travel writing. You know, you'll have a lot of um, sort of, you know, grey nomads who retire and can take great photos, perhaps string a sentence together, and they pitch all their stories to, um, you know, travel mags and papers, but actually that's undermining, you know, Mm -hmm. the living of, of real travel writers who struggle to make a living and to get paid what they're worth. So, yeah, it is really tricky um, kind of finding that balance. Um, we always say at Rachel's List it's best not to work for free if you can help it. Like if you need to in the beginning to get a few clippings under your belt, you, you know, yes, do it then. But as soon as you can, start to put a price on your work and start to, you know, demand to be paid, I think. Mm. It's really so, important. So as freelance writers, in order to really build their brand to be the in-demand writer, um, do they need to have a, a certain style of writing so that they're known for maybe their their cutting wit or, <laughs> or their in-depth research or their statistical analysis or, or, or whatever? Uh, is, is there such a thing when it comes to freelance writing? Well, you can. I mean, you can be known... Um, you know, for a niche. So it's kind of an ongoing argument in freelancing. Do you niche in one area or a couple of areas and really stick to that and become known for, you know, writing for interiors and interiors clients? So um, on on the podcast I do with Lynn Testoni, it's called The Content Bite, she um, has talked very much about niching in um, interiors. So she started off in interiors magazines, but now she um, writes for interiors brands. So she writes for like... Um, you know, like paint paint companies and bricking companies and she'll do content for those companies and it's sort of this natural segue. Um, whereas I'm more of a generalist, so I go after stories or clients or take on jobs that interest me, which means, you know, one week I might be writing content for um, a childcare website and writing all their copy. Um, And the next week I might be writing a business article for vets about, you know, whether they should um, be doing social media, (laughs) you know, like for a vets business magazine or something like that. So I just do a lot of different things and that way I don't get bored. So I think, you know, yeah, there's definitely an argument for niching and becoming known for that. And there's an argument for having your finger in, you know, a lot of different pies so that if, you know, one industry is not doing so well, so maybe food has gone down, you'll still have clients in business or banking might be on the up, so you can still get content work in that area. So that's how I view it personally. But um, I do know a lot of freelancers who niche very successfully. So it's really what you want to do, I guess, yeah, Mm -hmm. and what where your interests lie. Yeah, I guess with freelancing, what it is, is it it really is your ability to be able to market yourself and pitch yourself into a role as well. Yeah. yeah. What's the best thing? What is the most amazing thing about being a freelancer? Um, <laughs> apart from working in your pyjamas, <laughs> the old cliche. <laughs> um, well, for me, I think like I was saying before, the freedom to be able to chase jobs and clients and the type of work that I'm interested in. 
I love that aspect of it. I'm not tied to one magazine. I'm not tied to just movie reviewing. I'm not tied to only writing about, you know, interiors or women's, you know, issues or something like that. Um, so there's that incredible freedom about it that I love. Um, and I don't know, there's really something about being your own boss mm. that is so enticing and so addictive, you know, like you get to a point where you think, would I actually be able to slot back into an office? Could I cope with it? You know, could I cope with having people around me all the time? And, you know, would it drive me bonkers? And for me, the answer is absolutely yes, it would drive me bonkers. You know, I'm very much a, you know, I like my own space and I like to, I like the quiet when I'm trying to write and all of that sort of thing. But I think it's different for everybody, you know, Um, but you have to, I think it takes a certain person to be a successful freelancer. I don't think everybody is cut out to do it. And and we definitely see that at Rachel's List. You know, people drop in and out and, um, you know, will say oh, it's not for me and I'm going back to a full-time job and, and that's totally fine it, because, you know, some people really love that camaraderie and that water cooler chat and they miss being part of a team. And, and I do too. There are times when I wish you know, I could go back and be part of a team on a magazine. So there's something really special about putting a magazine together every week or every month and it's exciting and the deadlines and you're all working together and I love, I really do miss that. Um, but I don't think I'll give it up. I don't think I'd give up my life and how I've carved it out to suit me because, yeah, there's something just so great about that yeah oh, I know I, I, I feel exactly the same way yes yeah. running my own coaching practice it's exactly. fantastic because yeah. I can choose who I want to work with and who I don't work with I can choose the days that I want to how work. often you work yeah. yeah and I don't need to say please may I have some holiday <laughs> Yeah, because you're you, the boss. Yeah, <laughs> mind you, on the other side, there is no paid leave and there's there's no paid medical. That's true. That's so, true. So there are, there are certain things that you gain, but you always lose something when you gain something. Awesome. Now, when we first met, uh, Rachel's list was quite young, but yes. now Rachel's list is well established and there's so much amazing stuff going on within yes. Rachel's list and it's just grown exponentially. So, so tell us about Rachel's list and tell us how it helps freelancers. Okay, so um, just for a very quick background, um, back when I was doing the movie reviewing and, you know, didn't know that many people and was quite isolated, I started doing a job sharing thing with three other with two other journalists. And so we were all sort of sharing a job on TV week, writing these TV articles. Um, and so we ended up going out and having lunch together because we'd never met. And so I left them a note and said, do you want to meet? And they said, yes. So we went out and had yum cha and got on like a house on fire but because we were all sharing this same job. It was really funny. And that lunch just became a regular thing. Every month we would meet and catch up and, you know, and other people started to say, oh, I'd really love to come along to your freelancer's lunch. So we started saying, okay, well, let's book a bigger table. And so we would just invite these people and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually I was sort of the keeper of the list of people that were coming to this lunch. And so I said, okay, just put, you know, email me if you want to be on the list and we'll let you know when the next lunch is or whatever. So this list just because it started as a little trickle of three people and it grew and grew and grew over the years. And editors started to realise that I had it and I, I had this list of freelancers, you know, and so they would send me emails and say, oh, Rachel, we really need a sub on Monday. Can you put a word out to your list? And they would fill it, the role, in two seconds flat. Or they'd say, we, we need a new, you know, feature writer for Woman's Day. Can you put that out to your list? They would find someone within an hour. So it was this underground free, unofficial kind of recruitment little, you know, um, thing. And it just um, exploded. And by the time I thought, well, what do I do with it? There was 800 people on it. And I was like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? And another freelancer, Leo Wiles, came to me and she said, why don't we put some money into it and turn it into a website and, and try to monetize it, like charge for jobs and turn it into a jobs board. So that's what we did. So um, so it started off then with 800 members and, yeah, and it's just kind of grown and grown. So now it has, I don't know, seven, 8,000 members or something and 
a lot of job posters from all kinds of companies. So we've got magazines. It originally obviously started with editors and magazines, but now we have like um, content managers con- and, um, you know, agencies coming and posting. We have lots of um, academic departments who are looking for writers or creatives in different ways. Um, lots of government departments come and post as well. Um, we have still have publishers, so custom publishers and consumer publishers. Um, it's just, and then also small businesses will come because they might need a copywriter to write their website copy or they might need someone to write a brochure um, or, you know, work on their social media or something. So it's such a wide range of job posters that we get um, who are coming for this. But the the kind of USP for Rachel's List is every job seeker who's on there is sort of pre-approved. So we check them out and then they're approved to be on there and then if they want to have gold membership they can um, upgrade to gold membership and then apply for jobs um, or whatever they like behind the paywall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. And so with how, how does the, the paid version of Rachel's List work? So basically we have um, an entry-level list for, you know, people who are starting out in media or digital or comms or PR, and that's free, but it's an external list to the website. Um, And then we have a free version, obviously, where you can sign up as a job seeker. And once you're approved, you're on the newsletters, you can see the jobs coming through, but you can't apply for anything. You can't see the full job spec. Um, You have to upgrade to gold membership in order to see the full jobs and to apply. And that um, is, we're just about to put our price up for that um, in the new year to $34.95 a year. So pretty cheap. (laughs) $34.95 Australian a year. Yes. For this. Yeah. Gosh, you need a business manager. (laughs) (laughs) The thing is a lot of our job seekers are, you know, either starting out or they're, you know, they're kind of, um, you know, don't earn a lot of money. So we tried to make it you know, a a fair price. But, Mm. yeah, we will, we do put it up, you know, every year or so. I think this might be the first time we've put it up in a couple of years actually. So, Well, I guess you can have different levels of membership as well. Yeah, yeah. So with with each level you get something a little bit more, a little bit more, maybe additional training or something. Now, I know you've been um, very inventive and creative (laughs) and you're adding even more value for the members of Rachel's List by offering a series of masters masterclasses for training for freelancers yes well we had people come to us they were always asking us to do webinars or do a course or do training of some kind and so we thought okay this was the year that we actually thought right we're going to do it we're actually going to do it put um a series of winter masterclasses together so we came up with the three ideas um and and they were sort of loosely based on what our members had been asking for um and we had them three weeks apart over winter of this year. And so what did we do? The first one was um, Beyond Journalism. So it was basically aimed at a lot of journalists who are perhaps um, coming out of a, you know, in-house role and starting to become freelance or um, have been retrenched. And I know, Jane, that you've um, seen a lot of those cross your path. I've coached so many, especially when Fairfax was wielding its axe. Uh, this is it. And, and I talked on a panel to um, Fairfax um, staffers who had been retrenched, you know, and were suddenly dipping their toe in the freelance world. And, you know, it can be quite scary because suddenly you've gone from, you know, being on a newspaper where, you know, someone hands you a story and says, go and do this, and to actually having to run your own business, pitch stories, handle all your invoicing and admin and your own IT and you've got to wear so many hats. It's not really like being on staff at a newspaper or a magazine. So um, and and we also wanted to we wanted to do a masterclass that let those people know, you know, that they were good writers and they could parlay their skills into other areas. They just needed to figure out what areas that they would be suited to and how they could upskill. So we that first masterclass was really popular because we called it Beyond Journalism and it was all about how to, you know, um, use your journalism skills or your writing skills to go into content writing or copywriting um, or teaching or training, um, PR and that sort of thing. And um, so that was the first one we did. Then we did another one which is, um, all about visibility. 
So, you know, and we've talked, I think, Jane, you and I, about how important it is to market yourself as a freelancer, how important it is to be visible to clients and to be found. And and that includes, you know, everything from optimising your website with SEO to, you know, being active on social media, engaging with, you know, people in your space and, um, you know, perhaps writing um, your LinkedIn posts, um, are they called posts? LinkedIn articles. They're LinkedIn articles, and LinkedIn. also you can. Can write you tell I've never written one? <laughs> <laughs> it's time, Rachel. It's time. You know, you know, I'm a big advocate of LinkedIn being a LinkedIn trainer. Yes, yes. But, uh, but, so, but so you can write LinkedIn articles, and it's such a great platform <laughs> because it's free, and so you can really yeah. brand yourself by writing the LinkedIn exactly. articles. But you exactly. can also write short form posts, which mm. get a lot more engagement as well if you're really yep. trying to build your brand but yep. but so so this is good so so your masterclass covers the visibility, visibility. and then there's there's yeah. one more masterclass which is to do we with did clients. the pitching one yeah yeah and this one was very popular as well because we had um three editors we had a digital editor a print editor and an editor from custom media from mm-hmm. hardy grant um and they were all brilliant in their own way and talked about you know um what they look for in a pitch um what they what makes them use freelancers over and over um the anatomy of a good pitch and and that sort of thing and then we also had lindy alexander who i'm sure you would have come across on linkedin perhaps and she is an absolute dynamo legend actually a really good person for you to get on the podcast she was a social worker who decided to become a writer and she retrained and um writes an incredible blog called The Freelancer's Year. So Lindy, uh, we flew Lindy up from Melbourne and she did a whole um, kind of session in that pitching masterclass on how to pitch to high-paying corporate clients by and how to do that via LinkedIn and some of the strategies that she used. Mm-hmm. And then each of these masterclasses, we had them videoed and so we turned them into videos. And then at the same time, we had our shop com- on Rachel's List completely revamped called The Toolkit and we put the videos in there and they've, they've done really, really well. So we were quite um, happy with our, our first, you know, series of masterclasses and it's made us think we must do that again. But it's a lot of work. <laughs> so, oh, it yeah. is, it is. And especially, yeah. you know, liaising and getting all, all the really good talent to be able to join you and provide their expertise. And so Absolutely. now that you've got this toolkit, it's part of the membership or can people who are not members also purchase this training? Absolutely. The toolkit um, was always on the website. It was just like a shop that was on the website. So anyone could come and buy any of our resources. And we created a lot of the things that have been really popular on the toolkit is a pay rates report. So we, her, Rachel's List has been known for doing the um, show me the money surveys where we surveyed our um, our members about what they were getting paid. And then we took that data um, and have put it into a pay rates report that people can download and they can use it to give to their clients and um, it's something for job posters so they know what to pay freelancers and it kind of lists market rates for a whole range of creative, um, you know, uh, creative freelancers um, Mm -hmm. from, you know, content writing to copywriting to journalism, social media, design. Um, So it's a really useful one and that's free. That has been gone absolutely nuts this pay rates report but we also do trackers um so people can buy something called the pitch tracker and they can track all their story pitches in this um document um there's a client tracker where they can track you know new leads and existing clients and nurture both in the same sort of um spreadsheet and we've got an expert tracker so we were really known for those then we added in the master classes And then we've got a few templates like agreements that people can buy and modify to send to clients. We've got a rate card. That was the first thing we ever did years ago. So we've got heaps of resources for freelancers and they can be purchased by anyone um, as well as our members. But the great thing is since we got the new shop, we're able to do discount codes and things like that. So it's it's been a really nice thing having a proper shop. 
Mm. at last. (laughs) Rachel's list has really grown organically so well because it sounds like you've productized your product in a way. You know, your list, you've productized so that you're able to have an alternative uh, uh, income stream as well. And, you know, you're, you're actually running a business that's growing very successfully. So there you go from freelancer to entrepreneur. (laughs) I know somehow I juggle both I have no idea how Jane (laughs) it's a lot of work not enough hours in the day no not really but either that or you just don't get enough sleep that too (laughs) but funnily enough my little one he um I think when we first met I was maybe pregnant and Mm -hmm. he's now five so he's going Mm -hmm. to school next year so for the first time ever I'll actually be working five days a week, which I haven't done for five years. So it's quite exciting to think about what I'll be able to achieve. (laughs) Well, I wonder. I just wonder if you're going to think I'm just too tired. I'm working too much. Maybe I'll take a year off. (laughs) That would be nice. (laughs) Now, now, uh, Now, I'll bet you anything that anyone who's thinking about freelancing, especially creatives, um, who are thinking, you know, how on earth can I transition into uh, self-employment as a freelancer? They're going to find Rachel's list so useful because, you know, there are so many jobs that you post there. And really, you're the one who's in the know. You know what's going on. Um, and, yeah. and so now you reach a global audience. So are you, do you also have global jobs? Because with freelancing, really, you can work remotely. You could be lying on a beach writing away uh, without any problem at all, yes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we do have some global job global job set, uh, posters coming to us we recently had um, a company in the UK who um, they were like a water company and they were looking for a content editor but they wanted them based in Australia and sometimes we'll get UK magazines saying we want a sub but they have to be based in Australia so that they can work on the hours that we're sleeping so when they wake Mm -hmm. up all the work's done sort of thing so it can be really useful for overseas job posters to use Rachel's Lives um and we'd love that to happen more but it's um and then our job seekers a lot of I would say that 90% of them are based in Australia and the others that aren't would be Australians who are traveling and intending to come back to Australia but might be living overseas temporarily or something like that. Mm. Um, And, yeah, and that's our absolute priority, Jane, is to get more of those remote jobs. And we're finding it it's a lot easier as time goes on because I think, you know, we say that sort of bums-on-seat mentality where companies seem to want you there and, and, you know, they don't think the work's going to be done unless they can actually physically see you in the office. I think that's really shifting and Mm. I can see that changing and and there's more trust happening and companies are starting to realize well actually it helps their bottom line if they don't necessarily have all their staff there you know they don't have to pay as much for offices and and there are so many tools now that can help teams collaborate really successfully and you know get the job done even though they might be spread out all over the world or even all over Australia so yeah, yeah. You know. using apps like Trello or Basecamp are fantastic you know for managing yeah. projects globally Absolutely. now e- even even on LinkedIn you can search for jobs and instead of putting a city you can put remote yeah and um, they post remote jobs as well I'm sure that with freelancing it, it yeah. really I mean Rachel's list is poised to go global in a big way because yeah. you know I mean w- with with freelancing being so very very popular now the gig economy as you know yeah. um, it, it really is not location based and as you say if you can if you can actually capitalize on uh, being 12 hours different say yeah uh, with the time difference you know as London now is 11 hours difference yeah uh, yeah you're working through the night they're sleeping they're sleep uh, they're working during the days and you're sleeping whatever that would make a lot of sense so now if someone wants to find out more about Rachel's list right, mm-hmm. where would they find you so they can find they can go straight to the website which is rachelslist.com.au or we're on twitter at Rachel's List. Facebook, Rachel's List. Instagram, Rachel's List. <laughs> See a recurring theme here. It's easy to find. Rachel's <laughs> List, everybody. And yes. it's R-A-C-H-E-L. Yes, E-L-S. Yes. L-I-S-T. Yeah. yeah. Not, not 
not with the AE because you know, Rachel has no spelling. So the simple so spelling. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'll what I'll do is I'll pop on to janejacksoncoach.com um, forward slash podcast. In our show notes, I yep. will have all of your links there. So so anyone who wants to reach you, they can just click straight through and find you. And right. also there's another website that's that's very interesting because if you want Rachel herself, people who are listening, you can <laughs> go to rachelsmith.com.au and find out all about Rachel her story and everything that she can offer you as a freelancer as well. So, so there's yeah. another site that you'll need to hop over to. So Rachel, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. You've given lots of valuable insights that will inspire a lot of people who are thinking about going freelancing, but perhaps has, uh, they've been a little bit afraid to do so. <laughs> and, and so now, you know, they can give it a go. And, and especially journalists, I mean, honestly, most, most organizations now prefer to have freelancers because it doesn't tie up their headcount. Yeah. And, um, and, and that way they can really capitalize on uh, the busy times when they need lots of people working, when it's quiet, they don't need to be spending all that in the salaries as well. And having a good freelancer you can rely on is gold isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's so true because freelancers come under another budget, you know, so you often can, you know, take the pressure off a little bit by hiring a freelancer, even temporarily. So yeah, yeah it's yeah. good to, it's good to find the ones you, you want to find the ones that, you know, um, that are good and then you hold on to them. <laughs> you don't want to share them with anyone. Yeah. Well, how lucky that there were three, th- Three freelancers, I'll say that, that's a tongue twister. Three freelancers <laughs> who were having lunch one day and decided to, to let it grow to, oh my goodness, now you've got, what, seven, 8,000 members on Rachel's list? Something between that, yeah, between seven and 8,000, yeah. yeah. It's just yeah. incredible. That's, that's fantastic. Well, well, congratulations. Well Thank done. You. And do you have any parting words of wisdom you want to leave us? My parting words of wisdom... Mm. Right. Well, I think I really need to go back to what I said earlier, have a buffer, you know, um, have a good three to six months buffer of expenses. I think that's really important because it will dictate um, the types of clients that you can go after and take on instead of starting low, because then you'll constantly be clawing your way up to trying to make a living and struggling and working all the time. And you don't want to do that because you want to have some work-life balance. Um, I would seek out other freelancers. I think it's really important to have a posse. So I would look at um, joining freelancer groups like the Freelance Jungle, which is a really useful group on Facebook. Um, So many freelancers from all walks of life. And it's also um, a really nurturing space and, you know, um, talks a lot about, you know, staying healthy as a freelancer, mental health, um, that sort of things, a lot of self-care, which is really important. You know, you can not look after yourself. And I think that that's really important. You know, you want to have that balance. You want to, you know, and it's, and it's difficult to do. So I think find your posse, find your tribe, you know, find people who are working in your space and, and don't, don't fear that, you know, that you're going to be, you know, everyone thinks, oh, I'm, I, I can't make friends with the competition, but actually the more people that you find and the more people that you network with and the more people that you befriend in your space, the more work comes to you. It's really quite a, you know, magical thing um, once you once you start to do it. And it's also really nice to have that network around you. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Having, having an abundance mentality I think is important because Absolutely. if there's demand, yeah. then people will come. Whereas yeah. if you're going to think I'm going to keep everything to myself and yeah. think small, then yeah. less work will actually come to you. It's so because true. Because I, I always think the more you share, I mean, I'm surrounded by career coach, very talented career coaches. There's yeah. plenty of pie for everybody because yeah. everyone's got their own niche as well. Yeah. Yeah. And we've all got different personalities and we appeal to some people, we don't appeal to other people. And, you know, if, if I have too much work, I can I can pass on and additional work to others and vice yeah. versa and the same yeah. thing for freelancers as writers as well it's so true it's so mm. true I think that's the biggest lesson I've learned from Rachel's list is mm. how many people I'm connected to and it's actually a fantastic thing you know rather than being a 
yeah, a scary thing or these people are going to take my work and all that sort of thing. Yeah, so I think, you know, be brave as well, you know, and uh, be open to upskilling, you know, be open to looking at where your skills can take you, what you need to do to continually reinvent yourself and and move with the market because it does change fast and and the more skills you have the more employable you are and the more clients you can take on and in different areas and so you know it really is about that also realize that you are running a business you know and you are doing everything that comes with that you wear a lot of hats and you have to um you have to be very organized you know you have to do your invoicing and stay on top of your cash flow. You have to keep your admin, you know, going. You have to make sure you're pitching and hustling. Um, plus you also have to, you know, build in time to do the writing and the research and you want to meet deadlines. You never want to miss a deadline and all of that is going to help your business thrive. So it really is about having a business mindset as well. Yeah. That's a lot of tips for you, Jane. <laughs> That's a lot of tips. You are a mine of information. I think everyone should hop over to Rachel's list and check it out right away. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. For oh, you're me. welcome. It was lovely talking to you. And, and finally, because we've known each other for so long and we've never actually met, but now I feel like, you know, we've we've shared a cup of coffee together or a glass of we'll soda. We'll have to have a real it's coffee fine. next time. I think so too. <laughs> 2020, roll on 2020. And yes. in January, let's catch up. And, um, and I'll meet you face to face and I'll give you my book and, and you'll give me Ooh. lots of writing tips. <laughs> no problem. I look forward to it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, Rachel. And we'll talk okay. to you again soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, do hop over to iTunes and leave a review. I'd love you for it. All of the links mentioned in this episode are in my show notes at janejacksoncoach.com forward slash podcast. And if you'd like to find out what I'll be covering next, please subscribe to this podcast and I will see you next time. Bye now.